Good evening. Good evening. Um, so my name is John DeGravio. I'm the student leader of the Society for Conservative Thought. And uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank all of you for coming out today. I know it's a very busy time of year for students, for professors, for administrators. Um, but here at Williams, you know, we, we have a commitment to intellectual diversity in all its forms. That's really one of the goals of our group. And in the spirit of balanced discourse, we have the opportunity to spend some time here tonight uh, to think conservatively and to eat liberally. So thank you all for bringing your curious minds and your, your big appetites. Um, so before we welcome our speaker, I'd just like to recognize and thank some of the special guests we have here. Um, so we have a number of professors in the political science department, uh, as well as a professor from the mathematics department. Um, also joining us uh, are a number of representatives from the college administration and then also a representative from the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. So we thank you very much for your presence here tonight. Um, I would like to doubly thank Professor James McAllister in the Department of Political Science uh, for sponsoring and really helping to set up and arrange this event. Um, it's not often that students uh, have the opportunity to hear from, from such preeminent thinkers as, as our guest tonight. So we are very, very thankful to uh, Professor McAllister uh, in political science. And then finally, I'd like to thank um, the administrators that helped me just arrange and operate this event, um, and all those, of course, associated with Williams College Catering as well. Um, so our guest speaker tonight is an esteemed presidential historian and a scholar of conservative thought. Uh, he's a graduate of Amherst and Harvard, and he's been referred to as, quote, the dean and the leading light of historians of the American conservative movement. His 1976 book titled, The Conservative Intellectual Movement in America Since 1945, has been described by historian Forrest MacDonald as, quote, a masterful study that can be read for edification by people on the entire range of the political spectrum, end quote. So at a time of great uncertainty that we currently have in American politics, uh, we are very fortunate to host here at Williams, um, one of our nation's very luminary political thinkers. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome uh, Dr. George H. Nash. Thank, thank you, John, and good evening, everyone. First, can you hear me adequately at this level? Very good. It's a pleasure to be in your company tonight, among friends old and new, and to enjoy the hospitality of Williams College. I want to thank David Callister and your colleagues at the Political Science Department and the Society for Conservative Thought for inviting me and making this possible. I live in South Hadley, Massachusetts, a couple hours away, and as was noted, I hope this will not uh, cause me to be tarred and feathered. I am an Amherst graduate. <laughs> it is indeed good in all, of, all of seriousness to be on this campus for this occasion. And I've had the pleasure already of meeting a number of you starting at the Tunnel City Cafe this afternoon and of meeting your president, your new president. Very happy to have had that privilege. And just look forward now to giving some remarks and if there's time at the end, uh, perhaps taking some questions, I'll leave it to your discretion how the, the uh, schedule looks. So my subject tonight is American conservatism and the problem of populism. Several years ago, the New York Times technology columnist David Pogue listed the five stages of grieving when you lose your computer files. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and moving to Amish country. <laughs> it sounds like a fair description of the mood gripping many American conservatives before the 2016 election. And it sounds like a description of the mood of some of the American left ever since. Well, have conservatives lost their computer files? To understand American conservatism's current predicament and reconfiguration, we need to understand the present, how the present came to be. This evening, as a historian, I propose to do this through a lens that may not be familiar to some of you, the intellectual history of American conservatism since the Second World War, when the conservative community, as we now know it, took form. Perhaps the most important thing 
to assimilate about modern American conservatism is that it is not and has never been monolithic. It is a coalition, a coalition built around ideas that developed after World War II in response to challenge from the left. The coalition eventually grew to comprise five distinct groupings that I'll briefly summarize. First, libertarians and classical liberals who believed in free market capitalism and who opposed an overweening bureaucratic government and the ever-expanding welfare state. Two, traditionalist conservatives appalled by the weakening of the moral, spiritual, and institutional foundations of American society and Western civilization at the hands, they believed, of secular relativistic liberalism. Third, anti-communists focused on the titanic Cold War struggle against the evil empire of Soviet communism. Fourth, neoconservatives disillusioned former liberals and socialists who had been mugged by reality, as Irving Kristol put it, and who gravitated into the conservative camp in the 1970s and 1980s. And fifth, the so-called religious right, or as we now tend to say, social conservatives, appalled by what they regarded as the moral wreckage unleashed upon America by the courts and the culture wars during the 1960s and beyond. Each of these components of the conservative revival shared a deep antipathy to 20th century liberalism. The alliance was led and personified by two extraordinary leaders. The founder of National Review, William F. Buckley Jr., and a little later, Ronald Reagan, both of whom performed an ecumenical function giving each branch of the coalition a seat at the table and a sense of having arrived. I need not dwell upon the many steps by which conservative intellectuals and the politicians who became aligned with them moved from the fringes to the mainstream of American life after World War II. But one point deserves to be emphasized. The multifaceted conservative coalition that arose after 1945 was a Cold War phenomenon. The presence in the world of a dangerous external enemy, the Soviet Union, the mortal foe of liberty and tradition, of freedom and religious faith, was a crucial unifying cement for the emerging conservative movement. The life and death stakes of the Cold War helped to curb the temptation of libertarians and traditionalists to absolutize their competing insights and go their separate ways. Since the end of the Cold War in the 1990s, one of the hallmarks of conservative history has been the reappearance of factional strains in the Grand Alliance. One source of rancor has been the ongoing dispute between the so-called neoconservatives and their libertarian and non-interventionist critics over post-Cold War foreign policy, especially in the Middle East. Another fault line has divided lifestyle libertarians and social conservatives on such issues as the legalization of marijuana and same-sex marriage, as we all know. Aside from these built-in philosophical tensions, two fundamental facts of political life have contributed to the recrudescence of intramural debates on the right in recent years. The first is what we may call the perils of prosperity. Since the late 1970s, prosperity has come to conservatism, and with it a multitude of think tanks and specialization on a thousand fronts, a burgeoning conservative counterculture from the beltway to the blogosphere. But with this prosperity and that institutional growth have also come sibling rivalry, increasing tribalism, and a weakening of what I call movement 
consciousness, that is, a sense that you are part of a larger movement, as various elements in the coalition pursue their separate agendas. The vast right-wing conspiracy, as Hillary Clinton once called it, has grown too large for any single institution or magazine, like National Review in its early days, to serve as the movement's gatekeeper and general staff. No longer does American conservatism have a commanding ecumenical figure like Buckley or Reagan. Underlying these centrifugal impulses is a phenomenon that did not exist 25 years ago. What the late Charles Krauthammer called the hyper-democracy of social media. In the ever-expanding universe of cyberspace, no one can be an effective gatekeeper because there are no gates. The second fundamental fact of political life that permitted the renewal of friction on the right was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the stunning end of the Cold War in the early 1990s. Inevitably, the question then arose, could a movement so identified with anti-communism survive the disappearance of the communist adversary in the Kremlin? Without a common foe upon whom to concentrate their minds, it has become easier for former allies on the right to drift apart and succumb to the bane of all coalitions, the sectarian temptation. It is an indulgence made infinitely easier by the internet. The conservative intellectual movement, of course, did not vanish in the 1990s. Nevertheless, it is undeniable that unyielding anti-communism supplied much of the glue in the post-1945 conservative coalition, and that the demise of communism in Europe weakened the imperative for conservatives to find common ground and stick together. One of the earliest signs of this was the rise in the 1980s and early 1990s of an outspoken group of conservative traditionalists who took the label paleoconservatives. Initially, paleoconservatism was primarily a response to the growing prominence within conservative ranks of the former liberals and social democrats known as neoconservatives. To angry paleocons, led by Patrick Buchanan, among others, the neocons were interlopers who remained at heart secular, crusading, Wilsonian interventionists abroad and internationalists abroad and believers in the welfare state at home. In other words, the paleos argued, not true conservatives at all. As the Cold War faded, paleoconservatism introduced a discordant note into the conservative conversation. Fiercely and defiantly nationalist rather than internationalist, skeptical of global democracy, as they called it, and post-Cold War entanglements overseas, fearful of the impact of third world immigration on America's historically Europe-centered culture, and openly critical of the doctrine of global free trade, Buchananite paleoconservatism increasingly resembled much of the American right before 1945, before, that is, the onset of the Cold War. When Buchanan himself campaigned for president in 1992 under the pre-World War II isolationist banner of America first, the symbolism seemed deliberate and complete. Despite the initial furor surrounding the paleoconservatives, they have remained a relatively small faction within the conservative community of discourse. Still, as the post-Cold War epoch settled in during the 90s and beyond, they were not alone among conservatives in searching for new sources of unity. 
Thus, the first term of President Bill Clinton saw the rise of the Leave Us Alone Coalition of Conservatives, united in its detestation of intrusive government in the form of higher taxes, Hillary Clinton's health care plan, and gun control. Not long thereafter, a number of so-called second-generation neoconservatives associated with the Weekly Standard magazine, founded in 1995, issued a plea for a new conservatism of national greatness, an adumbration of the muscular foreign policy of George W. Bush. Bush himself, before he became president, championed what he called compassionate conservatism, in part a deliberate rebuke and distancing from the anti-statist thrust of the Leave Us Alone movement. For a time after the trauma of 9-11, the global war on terrorism became, for most conservatives, the functional equivalent of the late Cold War against communism. More recently, there has been much discussion in conservative circles of such things as constitutional conservatism, reform conservatism, conservatarianism, and crunchy conservatism, among other formulations of what conservatives should stand for in a new era. American conservatism, then, has remained at heart a coalition, albeit at times a fractious one. Like all coalitions, it contains within itself the potential for splintering, and never more so than right now. For as the Cold War and its familiar polarities recede from public memory, new challenges and conflicts have been filling the vacuum. Consider this datum. More people are now on the move in the world than at any time in the history of the human race. And more and more of them are making America their destination. Nearly 20 million since the year 2000. The number of international students attending American colleges and universities now exceeds 1 million per year, more than triple what it was in 1980. In addition, the United States is now admitting a million immigrants into permanent legal residence every year, more than any other nation in the world. This unprecedented worldwide intermingling, not just of goods and services, but of peoples and cultures, is accelerating with consequences that we have barely begun to fathom. Among them, the rise in the past 20 years or so of a post-national, even anti-national sensibility among cosmopolitan progressive elites and young people. Closely linked to these denationalizing tendencies is the ideology of multiculturalism, with its tendency to celebrate not so much American achievements, traditions, and common culture, but rather its diversity defined in racial, ethnic, and gendered terms. This brings us to the phenomenon of the hour, insurgent populism on the left and the right. In its simplest terms, populism, defined as the revolt of ordinary people against overbearing and self-serving elites, has long existed in American politics. In its most familiar form, populism has been left-wing in its ideology, targeting bankers, wealthy capitalists, and corporations as villains, the millionaires and billionaires in Bernie Sanders' parlance in 2016. From Andrew Jackson's feud with the Bank of the United States in the 1830s, to William Jennings Bryan's crusade against the gold standard in the 1890s, from Franklin Roosevelt's appeal to the forgotten man at the bottom of the economic pyramid, I'm quoting him, in 1932, to the demagogic theatrics of Senator Huey Long and Father Charles Coughlin in his early days during the Great Depression, populism 
has quite often been a left-wing phenomenon, vocalizing the anger of those at the bottom of the economic ladder toward those sitting pretty at the top. But populism in America has sometimes taken a conservative form as well, particularly after 1945. In the early 1950s, Senator Joseph McCarthy, Republican of Wisconsin, and his conservative allies denounced liberal Democratic politicians and pro-New Deal elites as dupes and even enablers of communist espionage and subversion at home and of communist aggrandizement abroad. In the 1960s, William F. Buckley Jr. famously declared that he would rather be governed by the first 2,000 names in the Boston Telephone Directory than by the entire faculty of Harvard University. That is, Buckley, a Yale graduate himself, would rather trust the political judgment, he said, of less educated common people than of cosmopolitan and mostly left of center intellectual elites. Criticism of an allegedly smug and decadent liberal establishment, capital letters, became a staple of conservative discourse in the 1960s and persisted long thereafter. Populism conservative style achieved its greatest success after 1964 under the leadership of Ronald Reagan, who brilliantly articulated a populistic libertarian aversion to meddlesome and unaccountable government, an aversion long ingrained in the American psyche. Consider these words from President Reagan's farewell address in 1989. He said, ours is the first revolution in the history of mankind that truly reversed the course of government. And with three little words, we the people. We the people tell the government what to do. It doesn't tell us. We the people are the driver. The government is the car. And we decide where it should go and by what route and how fast. No conservative has ever said it better. But notice now the crucial distinction between these two manifestations of anti-elitism so long embedded in our politics. Left-wing populism in America has traditionally aimed its fire at big money, the private sector elite entrenched on Wall Street. Right-wing populism of the Reaganite variety has focused its wrath on big government, the public sector elite in Scots in Washington. Left-wing populism was most popular in America in the 19th and early 20th centuries when, power, when powerful financiers and captains of industry appeared to control the nation's destiny. Right-wing populism gained attraction after the, after the capitalist establishment was displaced by a competing establishment centered in the ever more bureaucratic administrative state and its allies in academia. A few years ago, American conservatives experienced a revival of Reaganite populistic fervor in the form of the Tea Party movement with its slogan, Don't Tread on Me. In some circles, there has been a tendency to dismiss this phenomenon as either the artificial creation of right-wing billionaires or as the ugly expression of the racial anxieties of white people. The truth, I suggest, is more complicated. In the wake of the Great Recession of 2008 and the federal government's response to it, a powerful conviction arose among virtually all conservatives that public policy in the United States had in some profound sense gone off the rails. Rightly or wrongly, conservatives at the grassroots increasingly believed that ours had become a government not of and by the people, but only for the people, government by autocratic edict from above. The leftward lurch 
of the Obama administration, exemplified by the Affordable Care Act of 2010, was not, it soon transpired, the only source of Tea Party discontent. And this is crucial. The populist conservative revolt of 2009 and 10 quickly morphed into a bitter struggle, not only against the perceived external threat from the left, but also against a perceived internal threat from the conservative movement's imperfect political vehicle, the Republican Party. Despite massive Republican victories in the congressional elections of 2010, 2014, many Tea Party populists felt betrayed by what they saw as the inability, and even worse, the unwillingness, of elected Republican officials in Washington to fight effectively for the conservative agenda. Many at the grassroots, encouraged by populist sympathizers on talk radio, began to suspect that some of their elected leaders were not merely cowardly or inept, but essentially on the other side of the great political divide, particularly on the question of dealing with illegal immigration. The mounting frustration of grassroots conservatives, often derided by their critics as provincials and nativists, became part of the tinder, indeed the crucial tinder, for the firestorm that was about to occur. By late 2015, the perception that America's governing elites was no longer heeding the will of the people extended far beyond the Tea Party right. It helped to propel the improbable presidential candidacy of an outright socialist, Bernie Sanders. Until then, it appeared to me that the election of 2016 might become a showdown between these two competing brands of populism, the progressive anti-capitalist one and the conservative anti-statist one. Victory, I thought, would go to whichever political party better explained the causes of the Great Recession of 2008 and the years of malaise that followed. Free market capitalism or statist progressivism. Which is the problem? Which is the solution? On this perennial point of issue, the election would be decided. What I did not foresee before the summer of 2015 was the volcanic eruption of a new and even angrier brand of populism, a hybrid that we now call Trumpism. Politically, Trumpism's antecedents may be found in the presidential campaigns of Ross Perot and Patrick Buchanan for president in 1992 and 1996. Stylistically, much of the Trump campaign of 2016 recalled the turbulence and rough rhetoric of George Wallace's campaign rallies in 1968. Ideologically, Trumpism bears a striking resemblance to the anti-interventionist anti-globalist, immigration restrictionist, and America first worldview propounded by various paleoconservatives in the 1990s. It is no accident that Buchanan, for example, was thrilled by Trump's candidacy and is one of his most ardent defenders today. But instead of focusing its anger exclusively on left-wing elites, as conservative populism in the Reaganite variant has done, the Trumpist brand of populism simultaneously assailed right-wing elites, including the Buckley-Reagan conservative movement that I described earlier. In particular, Trumpism broke dramatically with the proactive conservative internationalism of the Cold War era and with the pro-free trade, supply-side economics ideology that Reagan embraced and that has dominated Republican Party policymaking since 1980. It thus posed not just a political challenge to the liberal establishment and a factional challenge to the Republican establishment, 
but an ideological challenge to the separate and distinct conservative establishment, long headquartered at Buckley's National Review. The distinctiveness of Trumpism in 2016 was that it was assailing three establishments simultaneously. So, what has been driving the Trumpist rebellion? I believe we are witnessing a political phenomenon never before seen in this country. The attempted creation of an ideologically muddled nationalist populist major party combining both left-wing and right-wing elements. In its fundamental outlook and public policy concerns, if not always in its programmatic figure, features, it seems akin to the National Front in France, the Swedish Democrats, and similar protest movements that are gaining ground in Europe. Most of these insurgent parties abroad are conventionally labeled right-wing or far-right, but some of them are noticeably statist and welfare statist in their economics, as is Trumpism in certain respects. Nearly all of them are responding to persistent economic stagnation, massively disruptive global migration patterns, and terrorist fanatics with global designs and lethal capabilities. In pro-Brexit Britain and continental Europe, as well as America, the natives are restless, and for much the same reasons. Trumpism and its European analogs are also being driven by something else. A deepening conviction that the governing globalist elites have neither the competence nor the will to make things better. The rise of Trumpism in the past three years has laid bare a potentially dangerous chasm in American politics and European politics as well. Not so much between the traditional left and right but rather, as someone has put it, between those above and those below on the economic and cultural scale. And Donald Trump, many of those below, have found a voice for their despair and outrage at what they consider to be the cluelessness and condescension of their betters. Facilitating the Trumpist revolt of the masses is a revolutionary transformation of the structure of velocity and velocity of mass communication, another facet of the phenomenon called globalization. In the past, upsurges of populist sentiment in America have often coincided with innovations in communications technology that rendered the voices of the little people more discernible and easier to mobilize. The populistic 1890s, for example, witnessed the dawn of sensationalized yellow journalism. One of its pioneers was a flamboyant newspaper mogul named William Randolph Hearst, a millionaire Democrat living in New York City who tried to become president in 1904. Perhaps that reminds you a little bit of someone. In our own time, the spectacular efflorescence of talk radio, cable news networks, the internet, smartphones, and social media have radically enhanced the power in the people and diminished the ability of elites to control and manipulate public opinion. In 2015 and 2016, the success of Donald Trump owed much to his masterful exploitation of these relatively new including two, Facebook and Twitter, that did not exist a mere 15 years ago. It is noteworthy that the three most prominent and comparatively highbrow conservative organs rooted in the print journalism era, National Review, Commentary, and the Weekly Standard, were centers of outspoken resistance to Trump, while some of the most popular conservative talk radio hosts and internet websites supported him with zeal. As globalization accelerates in cyberspace and elsewhere, it has become plain that the United States is experiencing a potentially profound political and cultural realignment, pitting, in the words of social scientists, 
globalist and transnational progressive elites against those who style themselves nationalists and populists. In the past two years, the tensions on these fault lines have flared into a struggle for the mind and soul of American conservatism. As the debate has proceeded, many conservative intellectuals have been attempting to accommodate what they see as the valid grievances expressed by Trump's supporters. According to the libertarian social scientist Charles Murray, the central truth of Trumpism is that the entire American working class has legitimate reasons to be angry at the ruling class, says Murray. Conservative generals, uh, intellectuals in general, I would say, now seem inclined to agree. But the problem for conservatives goes much deeper than expressing sympathy for the grievances of the aggrieved. If Trumpism were simply the anguished cry of a sector of the population that feels left behind economically, it would seem possible for conservative leaders in Congress to hammer out legislation that would begin to address the sources of anxiety. To some extent, they succeeded in doing so in the tax bill they enacted last year. Three obstacles, however, stand in the path of a smooth and total accommodation. The first is that the conflict between Trumpism and its conservative and Republican critics has become not just a dispute over economics and details of public policy, but a battle of intellectual paradigms, a conflict of visions not easily papered over by pragmatic compromise. To many of its conservative critics, Trumpism is little more than a mishmash of protectionist, nativist, and in foreign policy, neo-isolationist impulses a distasteful throwback to the world before 1945. To the Trumpists, conservative internationalism is a rusty relic of a bygone Cold War era. And Wall Street Journal-style supply-side economics, with its corollaries of free trade, open borders, and uncapped immigration, is an ossified dogma whose real-world consequences have been catastrophic for globalization's losers, especially in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania. For many years during the Reagan era and beyond, the leading exponent of supply-side economics in Washington was the late Representative Jack Kemp. Today, Kemp's chief political disciple, who in fact once worked for him as a speechwriter, is none other than the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan a man who shows no signs of moderating his Kempian worldview, and who in fact is about to leave Congress. Meanwhile, President Trump's former chief ideologist and strategist, Steve Bannon, proudly calls himself an economic nationalist, intent on building what he has called an entirely new political movement. The conservatives, he has said, are going to go crazy. It is not easy to see how, at the level of principle and theory, Kempism and Trumpism can be reconciled. In short, Trumpism, as a body of populist sentiments, has been boldly challenging the fundamental tenets and perspectives of every component of the post-1945 conservative coalition described in my remarks tonight. In his perspective on free trade, Trumpism deviates sharply from the limited government, pro-free market philosophy of the libertarians and classical liberals. Despite useful support for the right to life and religious freedom, Trumpism on the whole has shown relatively little interest in the religious, moral, and cultural concerns of the traditionalists and social conservatives who nevertheless stayed with him partly because of court appointments. In foreign policy, Trumpism has harshly criticized interventionist conservative internationalism grounded in the Cold War era, as well as the so-called hard Wilsonianism and anti-Putinism of national security hawks and neoconservatives. What Trumpism continues to address loudly and insistently is the insecurity and disorientation 
both economic and cultural, that large numbers of grassroots conservatives and others now feel about conditions at home. Whether this attentiveness to the travails of ordinary Americans will be enough to bridge the legislative and ideological gap between Trump and congressional Republican leaders remains to be seen. Trump has the biggest megaphone and the support of most of the conservative base. But at the elite level of governance in Washington, the conflict of visions is unresolved, particularly over the crucial issue of immigration. The second hurdle that Trumpist populism faces is the polarizing character and temperament of the man who's become its vessel and champion. To conservatives who refused to vote for him in the last election and who remain apprehensive, Trump is an ignoramus and boisterous showman at best, and a bullying proto-fascist at worst. To many on Trump's side of the Great Divide, it is not the president who threatens the nation, but the corrupt and obstinate Republican and conservative establishments sustained by a globalist donor class. Last year, shortly after the presidential inauguration, I visited Japan, where I had been invited to lecture about the history and current configuration of American conservatism. I arrived one day, after, one week rather, after the inauguration. During the trip, I was treated one day in Kyoto to an elaborate tea party ceremony presided over by a Buddhist monk. As we exchanged pleasantries with the aid of an interpreter, Suddenly, I heard the word Donald Trump. Donald Trump, the monk inquired, will he be a king or a joker? It is a disquieting question, and for many Americans, the answer remains unclear. More than 100 years ago, an American humorist was asked what he thought about Richard Wagner's music. He replied that it is better than it sounds. Perhaps Americans who are currently ambivalent about Trump will decide that, like Wagner's music, Trumpism is better than it sounds. Many conservatives are now taking this position as they point to specific actions by Trump that they approve of. But whatever conservatives think of Trump's policies, it is a sobering fact that nearly two years into his tenure, Trump himself has yet to receive the approval of a clear majority of the American people in the opinion polls. This is, I believe, unprecedented in the modern history of the presidency, and it is not a harbinger of sunny weather ahead. The final obstacle to the success of Trumpism may be the most daunting of all. The intrinsic nature of populism itself as a form of political action. Although populist attitudes and sentiments have long been present in American politics, major outbreaks of populist agitation have tended to be spasmodic and relatively brief. In part, this is because the most spectacular populist revolts in American history have generally occurred in times of great economic dislocation, as in the 1890s and 1930s. Once the economy has improved, however, the populist clamor has tended to subside. In part, also, it is because historically, American populism has almost always been a reactive phenomenon. And those doing the reacting at the grassroots are almost, by definition, people who are not engaged in politics on a daily basis, unlike the elites against whom they rebel. Sooner or later, populist eruptions, like most volcanic eruptions, simmer down, and politics returns more or less to normal, that is, to rule by elites. For nervous conservatives, this raises urgent questions. How much time does Donald Trump have to steer the American ship of state in a different direction before the current populist tide recedes? Or will his enemies on the left, by their own excesses, 
he is populist, conservative, based, mobilized, and thereby save him from himself. Meanwhile, as the White House merry-go-round merry spins with disorienting speed, various elements of the American right are attempting to fill the ideological vacuum. At the quarterly Claremont Review of Books, the website American Greatness, and the quarterly journal American Affairs, for example, conservative writers are striving to provide an intellectual foundation for President Trump's sentiments and initiatives, a hybrid version of Trumpism, if you will. In their opposition to multiculturalism, elitist liberalism, and transnational progressivism, a number of conservative intellectuals have even begun to question free market economic theory, to criticize historic liberalism, root and branch, all the way back to John Locke, and to celebrate what the Israeli conservative scholar Yoram Hazoni, in a brand new book, calls the virtue of nationalism. Whether this intellectual insurrection will reshape the conservative landscape permanently, no one can say. In conclusion, let me tell you a story. A number of years ago, I am told, a young member of the British Conservative Party was campaigning for a seat in Parliament. At a public rally, he zestfully defended the Tory platform and then concluded, these are our principles. If you do not like them, we have others. <laughs> this evening, I offer you a smorgasbord of conservative principles, or more precisely, a historical framework for understanding the evolving intellectual landscape of American conservatism. On its face, the American conservative movement may appear to be an unstable alliance, especially in 2018, when the fissures and populist pressures run deep. But for three generations now, it has also proven remarkably resilient, united in the last analysis by a recurrent sense of moral challenge from the left. And that may be a key to conservatism's future in the years just ahead. We are living in a time of deepening rancor and ideological polarization, in which politics is becoming an increasingly unbridled and tribalistic contest of wills. On the right and the left, too, the assaultive and apocalyptic language of war is being used to mobilize political legions. Provocative words like resistance, secession, civil war, and silent coup are popping up more frequently in political discourse. In this poisonous claim, the temptation is strong for partisans of the left and right to repair to their respective tribal barricades, driven by the ceaseless drumbeat of the binary choice. But we are not there yet, and I hope we never will be. As conservatives and progressives, elitists and populists, globalists and nationalists, chart their course, they should ponder the admonition years ago of the British statesman Edmund Burke who wrote, society cannot exist unless a controlling power upon will and appetite be placed somewhere. And the less of it there is within, the more there must be without. It is ordained in the eternal constitution of things that men of intemperate minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. Let us hope that Americans on all sides heed his words.
Hi, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I have a more of a question about like, the ideology of the left and how they seem to be going through a splintering of their own, especially you mentioned the Bernie Sanders um, populist movement as like, emerging and taking a lot of the base from the neoliberal politics. What I thought was interesting though was how it seems as though the left has more of a ability to like, set aside these differences, as, as it were, and work together as one coalition. And I'm wondering, what do you think it is an explanation for that? Do you think it might, it's something built into their ideology to, as this, I guess, work together better? Well, years ago, the American humorist Will Rogers, who was very popular in the 1920s and early 30s, said that, um, he was not a member of an organized political party, he was a Democrat. And in those days, the Democrats were a rather fractious band of odd, unlikely allies, big city bosses in the urban east, uh, southern uh, racial oligarchs in the south, uh, prairie populists and so forth, northern intellectuals. Uh, a, a weird combination, combination, but Franklin Roosevelt made it work pretty well for quite a while. And then the big unions came in and that added organized labor to it. So it's not unusual for Democrats to have big fights. Um, they seem to be able to get over them more quickly. I'm not quite sure what the psychology of that is. But then Republicans do. Uh, but not always. In 1968, as some of us may remember, there was a brutal, uh, literally a physical battle on the streets of Chicago outside the Democratic National Convention. And the Democrats did not recover sufficiently from those wounds to elect their candidate. Uh, Nixon defeated, Republican defeated Hubert Humphrey in that year. So that was the, the last time. And this last time around was, uh, was uh, fairly uh, serious, I think, on that score in terms of the anger level that at least I perceived watching television at the Democratic Convention. But of course, they had the the enemy on the right, if you will, or where how we place Trump, to uh, unite them. So often parties unite by the perception that the other side is so much worse that you cannot possibly let them get near the reins of power. Um, it will be interesting to see what happens in the next two years among the Democrats, because I think the, it's, it's a commonplace, I'm just repeating it, the energy seems to be on the, on the left. Now this is Thursday, I guess in another hour we'll know who uh, is the Democratic nominee over in New York. That'll be the last, I guess, event of pitting these primaries, pitting an establishment Democrat against someone more to the left. But however that turns out, I suspect we'll have more of them. Uh, one theory that I heard Stephen Bannon say in an Australian television interview the other day that someone sent me from Australia, uh, he said that if the Democrats don't win the House this time, he predicts real good fighting, a real party battle because it won't be cut and dried which way is the way to go. If they win this time on a, on a, a, fair, a powerful antipathy to Trump and increasing amounts of, of, of left of center uh, of policy proposals like Medicare for all and so forth, then that might, um, if they win, then they, that might provide a, a greater basis for unity um, in 2020. I mean, there will be disunity in the sense that there will probably be 37 Democrats running for president or something like that. That will be uh, not so much an ideological battle necessarily, but just a sorting out process. So um, I don't know what it is that, that permits Democrats somehow to go have a big brawl, politically speaking, and then tend to come together. Uh, maybe it goes back to the era of the big city machines, when, when all was said and done, uh, tell it a lie. Uh, I'll give you one quick example because it's on my mind for a book I'm writing. In 1932, Franklin Roosevelt went to the town of Seeker, New Jersey, in, the, in the, I think the very end of August, to give a big campaign speech calling for repeal of prohibition. One of the, the, the event was organized by the mayor of Jersey City, a rather notorious autocratic character, shall we say, who ran the place with an iron fist named Frank Haig, Boss Haig. Haig had been one of Roosevelt's bitterest, bitterest opponents at the convention just a few weeks before, and it was only over Haig's objections of his faction that Roosevelt got the nomination. But come the end of August, Haig organized what was then the largest political rally ever held in the United States. 100,000 people turned out, and they all cheered Roosevelt. And I'm sure Haig and his henchmen said, you get out there and you cheer Roosevelt. 
Now, why did he do that? He probably expected Roosevelt to win, and he wanted to be in on whatever deals are made, federal largesse and so forth, all of that, and he has, may have had his reasons. But there was a case where, in the era of big, big city bosses, the bosses played rough, but they knew that they had to hang together, and they also knew that they would get rewards if they, the spoils, if, if their side won the election. So that was a, an argument for keeping the Democrats together. That doesn't apply so much today, but once again, going back to my earlier point, uh, the, the perception that the left is going to, or that the other side will do so, undo so much damage or undo so much good is a powerful motivating force, especially in this um, media-saturated environment in which every morning I, I think each side gets up on uh, the cable news and talk radio and they find out what is the most outrageous thing that somebody somewhere said on the other side the day before and that is presented as a kind of representative uh, statement of what's happening. So each feeds off the perceived excess of the others. I'm not saying it's all cynical. I think much of it probably is sincere. But it is, it is something that maintains this kind of tribalistic loyalty. And I can tell you right now that the polling data is suggesting this, that one reason Trump still has 40 to 45 percent in most polls is that many Republicans who don't like him nevertheless think that they have to stay in this corner, A, because they see him doing some things they like, and B, because they think the alternative would be worse. So I will, I will stop with that. There's more I might say, but I want to give an opportunity for some others if there are other questions. Um, so in, in respect of everyone's time this evening, um, I think we'll have an opportunity for maybe one more question. Uh, but then afterwards, I believe Dr. Nash uh, has offered to uh, stay here and give a more informal audience to anyone uh, who'd like to speak to him personally with any questions uh, about the uh, I think it was you. Uh, I'm interested in your reaction to, to this comment, it's particularly about um, your claim about the existence of Trumpism. The, the what of Trumpism? The existence, existence, the existence of such a thing called Trumpism. And, and I guess I'm doubtful that there is such a thing, primarily because Trumpism lacks elites. Um, you suggested a handful of intellectuals associated with Claremont and American Greatness website, and maybe Steve uh, but these are kind of few and far between, and, and in particular, Trumpism lacks um, elites that actually have power over institutions. Um, they don't control uh, universities, academia, they don't control corporations in Wall Street, they don't control corporations in Silicon Valley. Um, Republicans have their elites that are powerful in these kinds of places, and Democrats have a lot of elites as well, and the followers of Trump have none of them. So this, strikes me that Trumpism is something that's going to have a very short shelf life. Well, I think there are, I would make a distinction. I think you could say, and I would say, that there are themes that, that we could identify as Trumpism. That does not mean it has the infrastructure to succeed and implement. So you could have the ideology without the, 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 the network that would implement it. And his own administration has many vacancies, for example. I just heard the other day. In, administration. So, uh, so I, I agree with you that it seems to me that it's very weak in an institutional sense. Obviously it has some mass support and it has this active coterie. I don't know how significant they'll turn out to be, but they're certainly energetic. And I told someone earlier, I think that this is where the, the energy is at the moment on the right to try to come up with defenses of nationalism, populist themes, criticism of globalism, uh, pro-tariff arguments, or at least arguing that we've got to be much tougher and so on. Where this leads in terms of a whole counterculture is, uh, is problematic unless some elements of the traditional conservative counterculture simply go in for this. And I do see some signs at the intellectual level that there are, are people who are exploring these Trumpian themes and trying to uh, give a rationale uh, for the policy initiatives. But I, 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 so I disagree with you in the sense that I think that there is a, something you can call Trumpism as a body of sentiment or thoughts and impulses or whatever, and there are attempts being made to intellectualize that. I, but I would agree with you that it does look like this is still uh, very much uh, a minor insurgency, and yet minor insurgencies can have a lot of effect, as Trump has done with administrative decisions. So it's not to be just uh, dispo uh, disposed of uh, completely from our thoughts. Uh, a lot will depend on how long he stays in office, whether he even perhaps conceivably gets reelected. This would increase, the, I think, the incentive for Republicans 
as a matter of party dynamics to um, say nice words about him and to appear to be in his corner. So we're striving, I think, quite energetically with what sincerity I can't judge. But anyway, they're doing so either tactically or uh, for other reasons to align with him. The longer he's there, the longer he's saying these things, uh, then there, that may pick up um, some support. And of course, a lot depends on foreign policy events and contingent events to whether they reinforce some of these concerns he's expressed. But I think you're right, in terms of institutional presence, it's weak, but the presidency is a bully pulpit. It does compensate for some of that as long as the president is there to set the themes with the daily tweet. And that would be my part, partial agreement, partial differentiation perhaps from you. But thank you for the question, and thank you all very much.